Welcome. Good morning, everybody. So we're just getting rolling here for Crooked Tree Art Center's uh, virtual coffee at 10. Um, we're letting, we're, we're doing this through Zoom. So we're letting our attendees roll in and join us. Um, but if you're joining us on Facebook, hello there too. So we're live streaming there. Just bear with us as we wait a couple minutes for, for our Zoom folks to join us. And I see one of our, our biggest advocates in uh, Northern Michigan, Mary Gillette. Good morning, Mary. Uh, for our Zoom participants today, you'll notice that you have the option to ask questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. You can also add uh, comments, notes, questions into the chat. Uh, Christy and I will be monitoring both of those and we'll feed your questions and comments into the conversation as appropriate. Um, but if you want to say a hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from, that's always fun. Um, you know, we've been virtual with this program for, gosh, it's getting close to a year, it feels like. Um, and, you know, that has some, some challenges. But one of the amazing things is that we do see you coast to coast and that's, um, that's a lot of fun. So, um, be sure to let us know where you're coming from and, and how it's going today. It's good to see all the familiar faces. <clears throat> Even virtually, this uh, this just helps me feel connected. Yes, those familiar names, right? Even yeah. if you don't see those faces. Yeah, our friends are here. Okay, well, as those folks continue to roll in, I'll go ahead and kick us off and just say hello. Um, I am Liz Erlewine, Visual Arts Director for Crooked Tree Arts Center, Petoskey. I'm based in Petoskey, but I work with um, our good team over there in Traverse City. And um, hosting with me today, I've got Christy Wodak. Christy, wanna say hi? Good morning, everybody. Christy is our Education and Outreach Director um, based in Traverse City, um, and we've been working together on these virtual Coffee at 10 lectures for quite some time now, and it's our pleasure to um, get, get to it again today. Um, this season, Christy and I have been thinking about themes that relate to ideas of preservation and conservation. Um, we've had some shifts in our exhibit schedule and um, some some things moving around here and there thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. But these ideas seemed really, really relevant as we thought about what we have had to hang on to, what we choose to hang on to, what we do to, to keep things um, going and um, where we place that value, right? So last um, session, we were very pleased to be able to um, meet with Craig Hadley from the Denos Museum. Um, and he shared with us a wonderful presentation on how we preserve and care for um, arts and artifacts, um, especially things that we have in our own personal collection, maybe handed down and, and, and things of that nature. So please check that out. Um, we have that on our website and you can also see it in our Facebook videos. Um, but today we're thinking about how we preserve or conserve art in general. Um, when I think about what we choose to value and what we hang on to, um, obviously art is very uh, central and near and dear to my heart. And I think about all of the different pieces and parts that go into making that stay. You know, how do we keep art part of our lives? What, what is our obligation as, as a people, as a culture or an individual um, to come out and, and support the arts or um, actively do something to make sure that the arts don't get lost in the fray, right? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'd love to hear your, your comments and questions. So feed those into the Q&A and feed those into the chat or the comments on Facebook. Um, I'm going to um, kick it over to a couple of our panelists here, and then Christy can, can roll from there. Um, we have some other panelists with us. It's not just Christy and I today. Um, I want to introduce you to um, everybody who we have joining us, and then, and then we're going to start off with some really amazing volunteers and board members who we have with us. So um, one of our key critical volunteers is Michelle Boyer. Michelle, can you say hi to everybody, please? Hi, good morning. There's Michelle. And then I also have our dedicated um, board member and volunteer in our Trevor City area, Ragnar Avery. Ragnar, can you say hi? Happy Friday. <laughs> 
And then also joining us today is another board member who has a special presentation for us at the end. That's John Elwell. John, can you say hi? Good morning, everyone. All right, in the meat of our presentation together, we are very fortunate to have Allison Watson um, from, um, oh gosh, Michigan, Michigan Culture. I, I always say the acronym. Allison, say it properly so I don't botch it on live. Uh, That's all right. I'm from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. And thanks Great. for letting me be here with you. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, so to kick us off here, um, we're going to start with our volunteers. And so when Christy and I were thinking about this idea of advocating for the arts, first of all, let me just say that the idea of advocating for anything can sound kind of intimidating, right? Um, I actually remember um, my husband telling a story about some workplace training where, where they just called people out, hey, who feels like they need to advocate for this or that? And nobody raised their hand um, because it's an intimidating word. And, and so I've, we've invited you guys here today because we think advocacy matters and we think that you are advocates for the arts. And um, one way that I think people advocate and, and really by that, I just mean you stand up for, for what you think matters and you choose to, to take action to, to let other people know about it and, and to make a difference in that area. So um, Michelle and Ragnar are um, some of our key volunteers here today. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with you, Michelle, and see if you can let me know a little bit about how you see yourself as an advocate for the arts and what your role is here at Crooked Tree. Well, when I moved to uh, Petoskey a few years ago, I knew I wanted to get involved in the arts as a volunteer in some way. Um, my children are, were involved in the arts, my son in music, my daughter went into architecture because of her interest in the arts. And, and I had done some volunteer work in Ohio in, in that area. And so I knew why I wanted to get involved. So. So my first uh, venture into Crooked Tree volunteering was just to be a part of the education committee and learn a little bit about what was going on. So sometimes it would be helping out at a coffee at 10 or just putting some things together behind the scenes and just really learning what all was going on. So one, one real benefit I get from volunteering is just learning. I'm always learning more about the arts. I'm not an artist myself. I dabble in some little things for fun, but, it, but it's just all fun for me. So where I am now, um, we've, we've restructured a bit. And so our outreach, uh, education outreach in uh, the arts is under our visual arts uh, sort of whole umbrella. And so I work with Liz pretty closely on working on programming for outreach. And outreach just means everything we offer in the communities that's accessible to everyone without fees involved. We still have to pay for it in some way, but we're not charging the end customer. It's, it's a way to bring arts to everyone and, and regardless of so, socioeconomic status or where they may, may be or, or whatever that may be, it, it um, it, that calls to me in particular. So helping with anything that goes into the schools, anything that helps to support art teachers, um, things that just uh, our docent program in the past, exhibit uh, tours. So those sorts of things are, are really where my volunteerism leads. But sometimes it's just a matter of coming in and, you know, putting together an art kit, cleaning up the art room, whatever may happen. So, you know, you can do a lot of different things. And, and that's what I enjoy about it, I guess. We appreciate that, Michelle. <laughs> and how about you, Ragnar? Do you want to speak to um, to your role here with the organization? Yeah, and my role <clears throat> starts much like Michelle as a story. So my wife, Christy, and I relocated up to northern Michigan in 2009. We had a, a vacation home that we built a few years before that, south of Kalkaska. And uh, my wife retired after 35 years at Dow and I was still working at Dow. I was finishing up my third year career. Uh, I had a few more years, but, uh, and uh, so we get up here in Northern Michigan and my wife was dabbling in getting back in into art. She had a corporate job uh, for a long time and, and that sucked up a lot of hours. So she wasn't able to do that, but she started doing some work in clay Christy, I bet you'd get a kick out of that. And 
lo and behold, she comes up here and uh, she met a friend who uh, said, talked about Click a Tree having a fine art show. And uh, <clears throat> I tell you, it was so amazing. It really struck my heart. She applies for this uh, fine art show with her, these three clay structures, and mm -hmm. she gets in. And it was like the affirmation of her journey as an artist. And that really, that really meant a lot to me. Um, I, for, I've probably said this story many times, but she, looked, she seemed like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon uh, because art was filling her and, and, and enriching her life. And the other thing is that because of that, we were starting to see there's a wonderful network of artists in Northern Michigan that's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And so that, that really actually started my reinvigoration with photography. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of doing the yin yang. She was doing the art in probably traditional media, mixed media and, and, and painting. And I was doing a photography. And so we started doing uh, working on shows. And I too, some of my early shows were at Crooked Tree. And I have to say, every time I went into Crooked Tree to deliver art or, or go to a reception, um, and I'd been at other places, but Crooked Tree, I have to tell you, really, it was always special. It was kind of like going to a spiritual place. I know it had a church background, but because of the art and seeing the different medias and everything. So that was my experience really from about 2010 through about 2017. And at that point, I was asked to be on the board. And like Michelle, I started learning a lot more about Crooked Tree and the breadth of services and opportunities that <clears throat> Crooked Tree offered the community from education to visual arts to performing arts. And it really started um, making, inspiring me to help. And my background is in, um, uh, I, I was an engineer but I, my half, last half of my career, I was doing commercial work, like, and I was consulting from 2013 through 2017 for startups. So I really had a fine understanding of business mm -hmm. aspects. That was kind of how I was getting my day job money, right? And uh, and I looked at at Crooked Tree, and I realized that this is a business of help in a community. And and the more I learned about it, the more I liked about it. So so my role within Crooked Tree started out with being on committees, as Christy will know, and Liz, you'll know, I've been on the Traverse City Committee because that's close to me and also um, has just as much uh, passion for serving the community and, and providing great uh, venues of art and education. And then in the last year and a half, they've, they've moved me up to now. Well, and then I have to say that that then got me interested in art to another level because we did Pink Grand Traverse. And Pink Grand Traverse was an opportunity to serve on a committee where you actually could stand side by side with artists as they were creating. And that actually enriched me in a way people wouldn't realize is that as a photographer, I started seeing how an artist, a, 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 paint, a painting artist, I'm trying to think of how that would go, but a painting artist, how they would develop that vision of that image in the field and it, it changed my my photography <laughs> so so that's pretty profound so um so that was a, a a wonderful benefit to me but then the other side is that the the org asked me what uh i've been i've been on the board now this will be my four and a half four to five year i'm on the four, i'm on my second round of a three-year thing and they've asked me now to be a vice treasurer so I'm using some of my business skills to help the org and, uh, you know, be sustainable and, and, uh, an advocate and being an advocate for the org staying on for another 50 years. So, you know, I look at this and, and this is, this has all been kind of like a story evolving. You can see how these pieces build and build and, and I think Michelle and John would say the same because we all have our own stories of how we came to this org, but I think we've all kind of been stepping up this stairway 
and 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 being more and more enlightened and more and more enriched by what Crooked Trees offered. So it's been an it's been an easy. It's not it's been easy and not easy at the same time. <laughs> thanks, you guys. So, so yeah. Um, so, so thinking about that, um, thanks, of course, for the shout outs to Crooked Tree. But of course, we have attendees who are joining us from all sorts of places and have different ways to connect um, with the arts in their own communities. And I guess I'm wondering, um, before we step into our next presentation, I guess I'm wondering if anybody on our panel today wants to comment um, about why you think it's important to support those community art centers. Um, so I, you know, I think it's very interesting to hear that both you, Michelle, and you, Ragnar, have connections to creativity, but maybe, maybe just doing visual art wasn't where you were at, you know, um, and here it's become a significant part of your lives. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that impact? Anybody want to raise your hand and say? I, I, can, I can speak to that. I am not artistically inclined at all. Um, nobody in my family is. However, back in 2006, when we moved to Petoskey, Crooked Tree was the center focus of that city, and it still is. And because of going to the school I did, Crooked Tree was putting on programs to help the, the young students in the younger grades uh, with the arts, with music and things like that. And it, and it was just so powerful to have that organization as the centerpiece of Petoskey as the community. And then the longer I lived there, the more I saw that it was reaching out and doing things, you know, dropping the ball at, at New Year's Eve and just having all these fun to activities. And it became a center for our life. We, uh, the girls went through violin practice. They went through piano practice. They, they did all these amazing things. And I'm not artistic at all. And I just wanted to be part of the, the excitement that was in there, the, the feeling that you got. Like Ragnar, you said you walked in. It was you just like, wow, look at all that's here. And it was right down the street, a couple miles you know, down the street. So when it turned and it came to Traverse City, what an opportunity for me to give back. So I started as a giver back because of what I received. And that's how I got hooked. And now I'm a board member and moving up like Ragnar is doing. I, I do want to just quickly shout, make a statement. Um, volunteering at any organization does not automatically mean you're going to be um, Put into the seat of a board position so you can volunteer and and you can make it fit your your needs your schedule i feel like we're setting a really high precedent here yeah, so. <laughs> yeah michelle, michelle. Go ahead. um i just wanted to say to crooked tree for me was open and every time i go in when you're not an artist and you look at arts organizations, sometimes it can feel intimidating because you feel like, well, I don't, I don't do that. I don't paint. I don't know much about this particular kind of art or that particular kind of art. But I'll tell you, the people at Crooked Tree in both locations have been just so open and, and accepting of who you are and how you come to the table. Um, so that was one thing when I started in on the education committee that concerned me was like, I'm an educator, that's my background, but my education was mostly middle grade, a lot of sixth grade, fourth grade, and, you know, just a lot of, uh, a lot of reading and writing and all those sorts of things. But um, I was not an art instructor at all, and I just didn't know if I really had anything to offer as a volunteer. And, you know, it's just been interesting to see how you can take Whatever your skill set is and whatever your strength is, whether it's knowing finance or, or whatever it might be, and there's a way Crooked Tree will find a way to, to make you welcome in the conversation and work at a level where you want to be, whatever you want to offer. So. Sorry, I the mute. It's the mute. Oh, Ragnar, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, you know, when I look at it, as I've been with the org, you know, both with TC and, and Petoskey area, and I, and I watch the activities, and I think about the community, what the community needs are. Um, growing up, 
you know, I would have art as part of my curriculum as a kid, right? And uh, believe it or not, I actually even dabbled a little bit in drawing and painting when I was probably in grade school and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, in many areas, if we look at a national basis, many areas, children do not have access to art in a structured way. And it's so important to have that balance. Um, my background as an engineer, but my philosophy as an engineer when I had a day job was to think creatively how to solve problems. And I, I emphasize the word creativity. And artists are masters at problem solving and being creative about how they solve the problem. Because they'll look at a scene or they'll have a scene in their head and the, the, there's a lot of pro, uh, cognitive thinking that goes into being successful. And it's beautiful to watch. And, and, and there's a process that's learned. And that's another key element of learning how to do things in processes. Michelle understands what I'm saying. You know, you think about it. So these skills are important. And, you know, I think Crooked Tree is a good example for a community arts center in that we've stepped up. And I know there's others throughout Michigan and this country that are doing it, but it's an important service to the community at that level. The other level is our seniors. You know, we all kind of, as you get that uh, gray hair, Y'all want to reinvent yourself a little. And art is a beautiful way to reinvent yourself, however you participate in it. Uh, whether you play an instrument, whether you volunteer and appreciate, be the docent, or if you're actually creating and, and putting the stuff on the, on the wall. Um, you know, as you age and you have less of a day job, you still want to feel engaged and you want to feel engaged in a community. And so... An arts center is a wonderful way to provide an opportunity for engagement for seniors. And in this world, we don't have that many opportunities for people to commune together in a network. And, and an arts center does allow that. And I relish the idea that the, the Artists Guild has started to flourish in the state of COVID because all artists relish the need to be able to socialize together and think, you know, like, you know, so <clears throat> this is given, I know I, I sat in on some of the first Artist Guild meetings and they, you could tell it was literally like they were starving for social interaction and with somebody that was a peer. And so it's, it's really, you know, you created a tribe. And I think that's part of what a, a community center, the important element of a community center. Well, we appreciate that, Ragnar. Um, let's uh, let's bring it to Allison because um, we just got a really good question about collaborating with um, other art orgs in uh, northern Michigan or the state. So um, I want to introduce Allison. She is the executive director of now that Liz Hitz was <laughs> said, I got to make sure I do it right. Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs. Um, she comes to this position with 20 years of experience um, with the arts in uh, Michigan, uh, the Jackson Theater Company or Michigan, the theater in Jackson um, with the Michigan Association Community Arts Agency. So she's got loads of experience and we really need to hear from you and, and your input on how people in, in all communities can help support the arts. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so. Yes, my name is Allison. I'm from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. We are a governmental agency. Uh, we receive both state and federal appropriations. So, uh, and with those, with those funds, we provide grants, uh, grants across the state of Michigan, providing grants almost in all 83 counties uh, to, to either support the operations of arts and cultural organizations or to support arts and cultural based projects uh, that are that are produced and presented by nonprofit uh, organizations in our communities, K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, and our cities, townships, and villages. So we try to offer a wide variety of, of opportunities for people to produce and present arts and cultural based programming. I'm happy. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, 
But of course, I can share um, with Liz and Christy any ad additional information about the investments that we make in your community and some of the long range programs um, and, and planning that, that we're doing in, in terms of supporting arts and culture across the state. Uh, and, and, you know, I never have enough time. I always, you know, I can, I can talk for hours. Um, and so I want to try to stay focused on, on talking today about, about citizen advocacy and, um, and, and why that's important and, and how you can engage in that. So um, one of the things though, just to jump back on the conversation that we just had, because I was trying to think if I, you know, trying to feel if I should jump in or not. Um, but I think, but I think it ties in really wonderfully with advocacy work is that um, you all are coming from a place where you're already engaged with Crooked Tree, that you feel that that home, that welcoming, uh, that welcoming feeling when you see the building. I mean, trust me, I, I, you know, driving up, uh, driving up the road to get there, you're coming up the hill and you see that build, your building on the left there, and you think, oh yes, I made it, I'm there. Not everybody in your community, and sorry for those in Traverse City that, that uh, they don't have that same experience, but uh, not everybody feels that way, right? Not, you know, some people are intimidated by those buildings, um, by what, what do I expect when I walk in? They don't know that they're welcome there yet. They don't, um, they don't associate with, oh my gosh, there could be a bunch of artists in there and I don't know what that is. I don't know how to walk through the building. How am I supposed to, you know, do I be quiet? And, uh, you know, do I talk? How, you know, am I going to feel awkward? I don't know where to walk. How do I stand to look at a piece of art? Can I, do I talk too much? Do I not? Am I going to say the right thing? You know, all of those things, uh, even though we might not feel them, are barriers to a lot of people in our communities still. So as welcoming and as amazing as our spaces are, you, uh, you know, I always try to think of who, who doesn't feel that way already? And how can we find ways to get them to feel that way? If, you know, and not everybody will. I'm not Pollyanna and think that it's gonna, you know, that it's gonna solve everything. Um, but I am tend to be a bit of an optimistic and wanna make every person, uh, you know, feel warm and good about arts and culture. And so I think it's important when we're thinking about our communities and the way that we work in them, that one of the ways that we can be good advocates just within our, you know, little, spot of the world is finding ways to always push outside of our walls, um, outside of what, uh, of our, you know, we work hard to have our, our buildings and our structures and, and our spaces, but I think it's important that we've got to push outside of that to think about where, where are people that we're missing at? Where do we want to engage? Where can we go out there and be in somebody else's four walls and maybe makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable because we don't know what that feels like, where we go. I don't know how to navigate that system. For example, we're, um, we're you know, just to, one of the things that we're working on, that one of the side projects we're working on right now is um, how we can cross, do some cross work with um, our Department of Veterans Affairs. I've never been on an active base in my life. I have no idea how that works, the protocols, all of that. But starting conversations, next thing I find myself on a plane flying to Virginia to tour this, this, this base, active military base, to look at their arts and healing program that they have on this base. Talk about being out of their, my comfort level until I finally got into the space. I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. Like, these are my people. I finally can relate to some artists going there. But to get from getting into there, you know, it, it was uncomfortable for me. But it was pushing, you know, us pushing ourselves of where, where we might not feel comfortable, but we know that there's going to be some engagement and how can we, how can we be open and sharing and honest that I'm, we're probably going to trip up and not say the right things. And guess what? You feel that same way about coming into our space. We feel that same way about coming into your space. So um, just going back to that, you know, I just think that open conversations and, and pushing ourselves outside of our walls. To, to look for engagements with other community members, other community-based organizations, um, different ways to work with schools, uh, you know, court systems, juvenile justice, all of those things of pushing ways to find out how we can get, uh, you know, my goal is that every single citizen in the state of Michigan, no matter where you are uh, on the big spectrum of what a person can or can be in our state, that I want every single person in our state 
to enjoy the civic, economic, and educational benefits of arts and culture, right? And so if that means that that me, the, the staff that, that I am fortunate, to work, fortunate enough to work with on a daily basis in our council are pushing ourselves into very uncomfortable situations at times, we're gonna do that because we've, we're committed to, to that, right? That's, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and so that's one way I think you can be a great citizen advocate in your community and for, for wonderful spaces like the Crooked Trees to push yourself out there and find ways to make connections outside of, of your four walls, outside of, of maybe something that you do in the park or uh, you know an annual event that you have, but what are different and unique ways that we can connect and engage? Uh, I think another thing that is always, uh, you know, the word advocate is, is tough, right? Uh, because there's a lot, sometimes you think, oh, am I advocating? Does that cross the line into lobbying? How, you know, I'm not sure, I don't wanna get in trouble. So I'm just not gonna say anything. Uh, and, and that's easy. And I don't know if you're thinking about elected officials and it's definitely like, I don't, do I know them? I don't know, what's the procedure? How do I go to Lansing? Do I go to Lansing? Do they have coffee hours here? I mean, there's just all these questions, right? So this is, this is my advice when I, when I wanna, when I start thinking and talking about advocacy is, don't think about them as anything else but your donors, right? I always think of them as they are my largest donor, right? Uh, crooked Tree, just because we're here, and I know there's some other folks that are in from different organizations as well. I saw Old Town Playhouse pop up, so hi. Um, but I, I, I say treat those your legislators, your elected officials, as that you didn't you didn't get the grant from us. We didn't sign it. I mean. Here's the thing. Yes, we make you put our logo on there. Yes, we do. You know, we make you do that. But I don't need the thank you letter because I didn't actually do anything. You all do the work. Who you should be thanking is, is those elected officials. That's why we want you to write those notes to say, hey, just so you know, we got this money from, from the, the Arts Council. We want you to be thinking of them as your donor, not don't. I mean, yes, they're a legislator and, and you can do, you know, we, we'll talk a little bit about advocacy, but Think of them as a donor. So thank you know, thanking them for their the money. Always invite them to your events. Again, if you had somebody say you got a grant for thirty thousand dollars from us, what would you do if you had somebody in your community write a check for thirty thousand dollars? Right. That's how you should be treating your legislators, whether it's your house, the house, or the senate. That's you should treat them as they wrote that thirty thousand dollar check to you or 10,000 or 5,000 or whatever it is. It changes in your mind, the thought process, right? They're not a legislator anymore. They've all of a sudden become my biggest, one of my biggest donors on a regular basis. So how do you treat them? How do you invite them to events? How would you give them recognition? Because the, and then not only those that are in the house and the Senate, but what about those low, what about your mayor? What about county commissioners? What about city commissioners? Uh, township, trustees, depending on where you're at. I mean, there's so many different levels. But what happens when you start thinking of those as those as people that are donors, rather than just trying to, how do I get into, a, you know, a, a, the mayor's office, maybe, or this can't get past my county commissioners, trust me. I, I live in an area that I bang my head against some of my uh, elected officials. And, and so I get it, but when you start thinking about them as as your donors, it changes. What happens when you treat the board, your schools, uh, the board of education, uh, depending on where you're at? What if you treat the superintendent or some of those board members also as your donors, whether they're giving you those that those funds currently or not? If you're trying to build relationships with them and get the school to support and maybe get a residency program in into that school, if you all of a sudden change that model and start treating them as that donor that's giving a lot of money, you you come at it at a, as a different perspective and they're going to start treating you because you're not coming at them with the ask all the time, right? You're not, I need this, I want this, can you do this, why aren't you listening? Instead, you're like, hey, guess what? We have this event, we'd love to offer you a couple of tickets, come check it out, see what's going on, or here's some kids that are already taking part of our programs that are in your school, why don't you come and see, or in your district, they love shaking hands and kissing babies. It's not, that's not a lie. I mean, that's, they, they do that. They love it. So um, give them the, those opportunities. And then when you do, 
when you do get a, get the opportunity to talk to them, you know, it, it's, I do the same thing. The thing is always saying, I want more money. We need more money. Can you give us more money? Uh, which we do need, don't get me wrong. I, I'm all for that. Um, but recently, uh, I don't know if recently, my feeling is that we've used that same, we've, we've used the same argument um, when advocating. It's been the same argument for decades, right? I feel like it's every year we're, we're always scraping for pennies and we're begging for pennies on a dollar and every year. And it's like, at some point we've got to change that game, right? It's not working. It hasn't worked uh, because we're always back at the table saying, please, you know, uh, little Oliver twist, please can I have some more? Uh, and I'm, t I mean, I don't, I'm tired of doing that. That was the worst Oliver Twist impression. That's why I quit doing theater. Uh, <laughs> I'm a recovering actor and probably will be for the rest of my life because of horrible reenactments like that. Um, but, uh, so totally lost where I was. Um, oh, so asking for money. See, again, I needed somebody to feed me my line. Um, asking for money is you know it gets tiring every year and every you know we're everybody's asking for money right especially now everybody wants more money you know more money for this more money for that and we all are deserving and so uh i think it's important that we try to find different ways to connect them to say yes we need money but what are policy things that we can think about and look at that might be beneficial to us in the long run that we could have long-term financial gains for. So when, so yes, ask for money. Yes, show them. Uh, and, uh, the ask comes later because we want, we're, we're trying to do is say, show them arts and culture in our state isn't just an add-on. It isn't something that we just do for fun and for personal enjoyment. You know, there's countless studies that you can share about how it, it impacts education. You know, we. we Ragnar talked about creativity in the workplace. I mean, there's hundreds of stories that we can tell you about that. There's hundreds of stories of, of what you can you can show about, you know, community development and how it builds community. And because of this, you know, there's maybe there's more restaurants or more coffee houses or more shops and the people come. So we can talk about, you know, tourism and, and dollars coming in. One of the, the, you know, we can show them Great news! The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis just uh, analysis just released that uh, in Michigan, arts and culture is a 13.9 billion dollar industry. That's huge. Now that's a big number that we're going to be taking to the legislature because so that they know it's not just a small little fraction. It's a 13.9 billion dollar industry. But I think what what is what we need to think about in, in terms of advocating and talking is that we, how does art and arts and culture intersect our lives in ways that we're not currently bringing attention to it? How are ways that we can think cross departments, cross agencies, cross organizations, cross communities that says, you know, for example, juvenile justice system, right? Or even adult, the adults incarcerated. I don't care. Pick one. If we think about, you know, the goal is, is that most people, we want to provide programs and services within, within the system that they're currently in, so that when they come out of that system, they are productive, engaged, active members uh, in a positive way in our communities, right? I mean, I think, sure, Pollyanna, that's the goal, right? And I know we can talk the other stuff, but that's the goal, right? And so when you offer programming inside facilities that, you know, tons of studies, programs already happening of arts and culture in, pro, in, 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 a, in a facility, right? But all of a sudden, what happens when we start doing wraparound services that bring the families together around that? So if you have a youth that's incarcerated, that hasn't had a good, you know, home life, maybe doesn't know how to communicate, the parents don't know how to communicate, and all of a sudden, through an arts and cultural based pro program that is in a secure setting, in a safe space, you start, you start building trust, you start helping them find ways of communication inside the facility. Now, once, once you step outside of that facility, 
right now the model tends to be those programs and services drop away, right? And that's where the disconnect happens because all of a sudden when I come out, I'm thinking I got to find food. I've got to find uh, shelter. I need to find a job. I need clothing. I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my kids or, you know, if I, whatever those things are. And all of a sudden, all of those pieces that helped us learn communication skills that learned, uh, helped us to think through decision-making process, to work as part of a team, um, those all fall away because we have critical needs that we have to address. But what happens when we pull that arts and cultural programming through that, right? So that as soon, when you are out of that system, just as important as finding, helping you find job services, helping you with healthcare, with shelter, with food, that that arts and cultural programming stays with you, right? And so again, pushing ourselves of how do we, you know, we all talk the talk about arts and culture having such an impact, right, uh, on our lives and how it makes a difference. But yeah, we're, we're isolating them. We're isolating them inside facilities, we're, whether it's a correctional facility, a juvenile facility, a school, um, a hospital setting, a, a senior center, we're isolating everything, we keep pulling. But what happens when all of a sudden we start thinking about how we can adjust policies and changes that arts and culture is woven, is you know actually the thread that pulls it all together, not just isolating. So thinking through those things in our communities uh, and talking at, to our elected officials about ways that we can adjust policies is sometimes a good way before the money asks, right? Uh, because then it, it changes the arc, right? It changes the arc that we're always out there with our hands out, wanting money, please support our program, please donate to our program. Instead, we look at policy changes in ways that we truly are affecting change within our communities to build our community and that arts and culture is integral, not only for the fun part, the fun that we want to do, because trust me, it's fun. I like having fun. But we're also critical to every single sector within our communities. And so, um, sorry, I'm trying to watch the time too. I told you I can go on for hours. Um, so I guess, Christy, I'll, Liz, I'll, let, I'll stop and let you, uh, let you tell me how you want me to go. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I have so many things written down, like just little prompts, and now I have to figure out how they connect to form them into a question for you. But let me first just say, uh, Christy, do we have any questions on Facebook? Uh, we do not have any questions on Facebook. Okay, so if there are questions, feed them into our comments on Facebook, add them into our chat here. Um, or them all to tears. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> going back to um, something that you said early-ish in that, um, uh, about our relationship with um, legislators as potential donors. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And obviously for those of us in attendance who um, fight for arts orgs, um, that's really eye-opening. But we obviously um, speak to a lot of folks who um, maybe don't know their role in, in that piece. And there were a couple of ideas um, that popped out to me when you were speaking. And I was thinking about how maybe it's not necessarily at looking at people as donors, because I feel like that's almost, um, oh, I still have you spotlit. Um, because maybe that's almost like, oh, who, who do we go to for money? And, and maybe the argument's a little bit more about how we just increase that visibility and that gratitude and those human connections, right? And, and, and as a result, we get that impact. So if, if I were not connected with an arts org at all, but recognize the importance of an arts program or experience or something in my community, um, maybe, maybe it's not about saying thank you to my, to my legislator um, because I want that money to come, but just so that they know right, mm -hmm. that, that that touch has happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's a really important power that we all have as members of a community. Yeah, absolutely. And most of them are gonna have some sort of touch point in arts and culture as it is, or you, or you can find ways to have it. I mean, I, we've been going through all of the new, um, all of the incoming legislators in the house, we've been having 30 minute introduction meetings with them. And some of them, you know, right off the bat, they, they've got their arms folded and they're like, you know, a lot of people are coming to us right now trying to get us in. And I patiently waiting to hear them say what they're interested in, you know, whether they're a farmer, 
small business owner, you know, this has nothing to do with it. All of a sudden you get them talking for two minutes and when you give an example, they're done, they're talking because they, they're like, oh gosh, do you know, I, I've been to that library. Oh, you do that in my community. And then, and then the conversation snowballs, right? So it's, it's, there's something about the word art and artist that turns people off, that it's a, this is them, this is me, that's yeah. not, I'm not an artist. I don't know how to draw because somebody probably in sixth grade told me I wasn't an artist mm-hmm. and I shouldn't take an art class or I can't carry a tune in a bucket. So something like that, right? And it turns us off. Uh, but what I always, I always, you know, kind of joke to people and I say, well, oh, do you golf? Oh yeah, heck yeah, I'm an avid golfer. Okay, what's your handicap? Oh gosh, are you kidding? I don't keep a handicap because I, you know, I can barely hit the ball straight down the fairway. But you call yourself a golfer, right? But yet I, I can't carry a tune in a bucket and obviously can't do great impressions from Oliver. Uh, but I still can, you know, can still associate myself as an artist, right? Um, and so there's a disconnect in language too, right? So, uh, but I think finding out ways to meet people where they're at instead of us always coming at it uh, with our with our artist caps and and our, you know, come to our space. Our, I mean, and don't and I don't take that as a dig because I love your space. Don't and you know, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's how do we change it a little bit? You know, it's like just shifting the conversation just a touch to all of a sudden get people engaged and thinking about it, right? Yeah, I think you're, you, we've just scratched, we just scratched the surface on things that we can do. And it's so important to maintain, show them not just the big events like the Paint Grand Travers or an exhibit, but the thread through everyone's life. So I'm just gonna pause here and go to our guest who doesn't identify as an artist, but perhaps a golfer. And um, John, how um, you are gonna bring to the table some different, some ways that people can advocate for arts, community art centers, organizations financially. Yeah, another way of saying it is a way of supporting it perhaps uh, <laughs> financially. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I'm very familiar with is, and and people have heard these terms, required minimum distributions. Uh, What that is, and and before I get started, uh, the CARES Act waived. We didn't have to have required minimum distributions in 2020. It's been reinstated for 2021. So I wanna give everyone that update. But a required minimum distribution is something that at age 72, when you have a retirement account, it could be a traditional IRA, a 401k plan, something that's considered a retirement account. At 72, you have to take that money out. It's never been taxed before. So the government's asking you or actually pushing us to take it out on a yearly basis. That way they get tax money and it helps support social security and so on and so forth. What I'm experiencing is people are contributing to charities of that and, and, and organizations that they really want to support. They're the advocates in that way. And um, it, it could be you know, a place of worship, it could be crooked tree, but the organization has to be a 501c3 and then you can take the money out you're being uh, pushed every year to take 3.6% out or 3.8% out. And some people don't need that money or they wanna use that money in a different way than just for themselves. So you could be an advocate for Crooked Tree and have a check written and sent to Crooked Tree. The benefit is you're not getting, you're not paying taxes on that money. And Crooked Tree doesn't take pay taxes on receiving that money. Mm-hmm. So that's with the required minimum distributions. Again, like I I just mentioned, there's only a small percentage you have to take out per year, but let's say you wanna be very generous, one year different than another. There is something called a qualified charitable distribution, QCD, that I'm gonna go over and I've got a form that I, Christy, I think you have the form that we can put up I do. I just shared it in the chat and we're going to also put it on um, the the website. So okay. I can screen, do you have me to screen share it right now? If you want, if not, I, you know, I can talk about it if everyone has a chance to look at it. Can you see it? 
there it is. So a qualified charitable distribution, it's a little different uh, just briefly from a uh, required minimum distribution. You can start doing this contribution or distribution at age 70 and a half. And what this is, is uh, this allows you as an individual not to just put 3.6% towards your uh, favorite organization, but you can contribute up to $100,000 to any number of organizations in one year. But there are requirements you have to, to follow in order to make this a non-taxable event for both yourself and the organization that receives the money. So this, this sheet here, um, I work for Edward Jones. This is uh, approved to go to the public. Please use this sheet. The very top shows you the requirements needed uh, to follow in order to make this uh, fully non-taxable for both you and the organization. Um, I'll quickly run down uh, the, the bullet points. You have to be 70 and a half or older. The funds must be issued directly to a charity from a traditional IRA most often, sometimes a Roth IRA. So I wanna go on that point. If you have an old 401k plan that's still with an old employer, you're gonna to need to take that money and put it into your own personal IRA and then call somebody like myself up and say, I want a check written to Crooked Tree Art Center. That way it does not get into your hands directly and it goes directly to the charitable organization and then it becomes a tax-free event. So that's very, very important to understand. The donor cannot receive any benefit from making this distribution. The amount cannot exceed $100,000 annually. And the checks must be issued by December 31st in the year that you want to contribute it. Um, with some of the uh, unfortunate mistakes I've seen is people had a money uh, order or a money market check written and they passed it to the organization, the very last bullet point here under requirements. The check was not cashed until maybe the beginning of the following year. So they didn't get that tax-free benefit for the year that, that they thought they had written it for. So that's a key point. So then there's, you know, write one, two, three, four, five, some best practices, talk to your uh, tax person first, uh, notify who you're gonna send the check to, make sure you know how it's made payable mailing address, so on and so forth. And if you're working with Edward Jones or somebody uh, like myself, uh, you request that financial advisor to have the check directly sent from your account to the organization. And then you're, you're, you're set. Um, at the very bottom of this form, there's a receipt that you'll be able to fill out and you can pass along uh, to your tax or accountant uh, to qualify for this tax-free event. But it's a wonderful way if you're not comfortable being somebody who can go into an organization or be a vocal advocate. Right now is a great time. Every, every charity, everybody, Crooked Tree, we all need the support. Um, it's an amazing job to keep a, an organization like this running. And by you supporting us in this way, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. So if you have any questions about this, please, reach out uh, either to Christy, who she can get me in touch with you or, or directly. But uh, it's a wonderful way to support your local community. Thank you, John. We appreciate that. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's the, the one thing that Liz and I wanted to try to convey during this Coffee at 10 is there are so many different ways that you can help support your local arts organization. And again, this is not just for Crooked Trees, it's for any of our local places. And, um, you know, you can get out there and you can, if you wanna help us get in contact and do some letter writing, um, help show the thread of arts through our community, um, stop coming in and helping behind the scenes. You know, Michelle talked a lot about different things that she's done and Ragnar has certainly done a, his fair share and, and John of, uh, you know, moving walls. I mean, there's physical labor, there's, all, it comes in all different, um, all different forms. Uh, do we have any questions from anybody as we are wrapping this up? Anybody want to send in a chat? I know um, we did have a question from Mary at the very beginning. Uh, let's see. 
I am like she, you know, her, her questions were about the idea of um, organizations working together. And I do see a hand up in the attendees list if you want to check on that while I talk about this. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, obviously we have these amazing advocates with us today for Crooked Tree. And thank you, of course. Um, we're excited about the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, obviously all of us in this panel today are pushing for that. Um, but having Allison with us here and talking about the work that's being done at the state level, seeing um, some of our other organizations who've been able to join us um, here in the Zoom panel, um, I really do want to emphasize that need to, to work together and tell the story of arts and, and, and find the way that we can impact those lives that Allison mentioned that maybe are on the fringes of the stuff that we've discovered and hold dear to our hearts, but they've never had that welcome, you know, outstretched hand. And I think when we think about that role um, of advocating for just arts in general, how important it is for us to create a time and space that that is welcoming to those who maybe don't see it that way. You know, how do we how do we get into those um, schools? How do we work together? You know, to um, to make that that happen, I think is pretty powerful. Did we? And and, and no, um, and we did have somebody who's watching on Facebook, and um, I think they're very inspired. So um, we're doing our job. That's you know that's that's at the end of the day, it's what we want to do is we want to inspire people, and uh, this group here certainly has uh, brought up different ways, you know, that they've been inspired, and we can continue that. So, okay, so I see Patrick has a hand up. Um, Patrick, do you want to feed your I, question? Oh, did you find it? Uh, I, I reached out. I'm not sure if they intended to. Okay, okay, yeah. good deal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, to our panelists then, are there do any- Do we have any final comments? Go ahead, Liz. I was saying what you were saying. <laughs> I see Allison unmuted. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you for inviting me to, to your uh, coffee break this morning. So I appreciate it. Great talk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you guys. guys for joining and thanks for all the work that you do to support um, the arts in your community. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Ooh. See you next time. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.